Before we begin, I want to take a moment to acknowledge that UC Berkeley sits on the territory of um, Huichen, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chochenya um, Ohlone. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Ohlone people. We recognize that every member of the Berkeley community has benefited and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land. Consistent with the university's values of community and diversity, we have the responsibility to acknowledge and make visible the university's relationship to Native peoples. By offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm indigenous sovereignty and our commitment to hold the university more accountable to the needs of American Indians and Native um, indigenous peoples. I want to take a, uh, this opportunity to also thank our many, many sponsors who um, have made this and this series of events possible. Um, first off, um, beginning with the Asian American Research Center, we have our fabulous staff, um, Deborah Lustig, Max um, uh, is here as well. Um, we have the Asian American Asian Diaspora Studies Program, um, the Department of English, um, the Doreen B. Townsend Center for the Humanities, the Japanese American Studies Advisory Committee, the Latinx Research Center, uh, the Center for Japanese Studies, and the Othering and Belonging Institute. I also want to thank East Wind Books, who are making available Karen's books here um, today, and, um, and a few of our students who are volunteering um, as our experts um, in photography and videography. Um, Maddie and Kelly in the back, so thank you um, so much for uh, you know making this uh, event possible. A special thanks also of course, to the Latinx Research Center for hosting us um, here in this beautiful space. Um, today's event is part of a series featuring the work of Karen Te Yamashita, who is the AARC's inaugural artist in residence. When the center was founded in 2020, we wanted to create an intellectually engaging, creative, and supportive space where scholars, students, artists, policymakers, and community members can come together to discuss and examine all sorts of issues and interests concerning Asian Americans. The AARC is a research center, and I want to emphasize that we conceive of research as being intimately and integrally linked to the creative process, whether it is through the research design, the presentation of materials, or the narrative form that it takes, or simply the practice of asking questions that have not been asked before, and constantly, constantly pushing the boundaries of what is considered established or conventional knowledge. And I think Karen's work here really um, uh, epitomizes that pushing of boundaries that we are trying to do in both our research and also in um, creative work. Creative works, as literary scholar um, Lisa Lowe has noted, provides us with counter-narratives of our communities. They help us access the forgotten stories, the historical erasures, and the resiliency of our communities. They provide us with tools to reflect the process of what we, and process what we see, what we hear, what we feel, before we can even begin to make sense of our own thoughts and to compose our coherent arguments. As a cultural anthropologist, I deeply appreciate what creative works, whether they be novels, films, poetry, plays, movies, bring to our understanding of what it means to be human, to be Asian American, to be a person of color, and to help us continually attune ourselves to our shared humanity. This panel is part of a series of events that we have planned for this week. And please do look at our website for more details. I am absolutely thrilled that we are launching this event, this series, with an exploration of Asian Latinx intersections. Reading her first novel, Through the Arc of the Rainforest, um, is how I first came to know Karen's work. Um, it blew my mind. It was something that challenged the genres you know, that I understood to be Asian American um, literary form. And I brought Brazil Monu, her second book, with me to the field as I conducted my own research on the Chinese in Panama. So I owe Karen a debt of gratitude for 
for inspiration and for affirmation that these stories matter. So thank you for amplifying the stories and histories of um, and, and imaginaries of Asian Latinx in Tanglecrest. And now I want to um, uh, turn and um, introduce um, John Alba Cutler. Um, it's a pleasure for me to have him join us today. Um, he will moderate today's event. Um, he is Associate Professor of English, whose research and teaching center on U.S. Latinx literatures, print culture, and poetry. He's the author of Ends of Assimilation, The Formation of Chicano Literature, which was published with Oxford in 2015. Um, he has also written articles in such journals as Aslan, Melus, Melus, I'm not quite how to pronounce the journal, <laughs> American Literary History, and American Literature. He is currently co-editing a volume of essays titled Latinx Literary Modernities and working on a book about Latinx modernism. Welcome, Professor Cutler. Thank you, Clark, and thank you all for being here. Um, I just want to start by saying what a thrill it is for me to be moderating this event. Um, I was, um, I think I, I maybe mentioned this, we had a, a meeting last week to talk about the logistics. The only way I can describe my experience of moderating this event is that I feel like I forced gumped my way into it. Um, you, uh, and that reference for those of you who are too young for Forrest Gump, but, um, because uh, I have admiration uh, and uh, love actually for the works of uh, all of these artists um, that we're talking about today. I have taught in various classes, Tropic of Orange, I Hotel, Atomic Aztecs, Sleep Dealer, on repeated occasions. And uh, so it is just, a, it's just an honor um, to be in conversation with Karen and Alex and, and Sushu today. Um, the format for today's event, I'm going to um, offer very brief uh, introductory remarks and um, introduction of uh, bio for each of our um, panelists. Um, they'll each then uh, take a few minutes to talk about uh, their work in relation to the, the topic of today's panel, speculative fiction, Asian Latinx intersections. Um, and then uh, I have a, I'll be moderating a conversation with some questions and kind of back and forth um, for uh, 20 to 30 minutes after that, um, and then we'll have a larger conversation where we invite um, all of you uh, in the audience here, as well as over Zoom, to um, ask questions of the artists here today. <clears throat> I mentioned that I've uh, studied and taught um, works by Karen Te Yamashita, Sishu Foster, and Alex Rivera on multiple occasions um, as a professor. And one reason that I return to the works of these artists is that um, students find them compelling for precisely the reasons signaled by the title of this panel. As they incorporate elements of the speculative, they help us imagine our world otherwise, offering both dystopian counterfactuals to the world we currently inhabit, as well as glimmers of utopian alternatives. In addition, they transgress the national and administrative borders that govern our encounters with Asian American or Latinx or American literature or black or indigenous, for that matter, literature, more broadly speaking. Uh, so uh, I most recently taught both Atomic Aztecs and Tropic of Orange in a graduate seminar titled um, Contemporary Experiments in Racial Form. It was precisely about books that you can't pigeonhole books that don't sort of obey the administrative categories that uh, the university uh, is governed by. There are no tidy categories, I think, that sufficiently account for the rangy and electric imaginations that these artists bring to their work. I'm holding here my, my copy of Tropic of Orange, and I wanted to just share with you one um, marginal note that I made the last time that I taught the novel. Um, this is near the end of the book. There's a kind of surreal, uh, Lucha Libre encounter between these two characters. One of them is called Super Nafta, and the other one is El Gran Mojado, that um, I understand is repre representing both the forces of state neoliberalism on the one hand and the forces of um, resistance and uh, uh, subaltern um, uh, culture on the other hand. And El Gran Mojado uh, sort of 
it rises to a climax where he speaks this poem and he says, I do not defend my title for the future of starving children or the past of suffering ancestors. I defend my title for life and death, the life of our people, or the death of our people. And my marginal note says, not reproductive futurism. That's a reference to the work of Lee Edelman. So I was interested in the fact that El Gran Mojado isn't, is not doing it for these future children that you can't imagine. It's not about the past. Instead, it's about the urgency of the present. And I think that's exactly what uh, all, of the, all of these artists are trying to um, get us to pay attention to. So I'll introduce our panelists in the order that they're um, for, going to present their preliminary remarks. Uh, poet, teacher, and community activist Sishu Foster grew up in East Los Angeles. He earned his MFA from the Iowa Writers' Workshop. He's the author of the poetry collections City Terrace Field Manual, American Loneliness, Selected Poems, World Ball Notebook, which won the American Book Award, and an Asian American Literary Award for Poetry, in which I reread every time there's a World Cup, and uh, City of the Future. Foster is the author of the novel of speculative fiction, Atomic Aztecs, which won the Believer Book Award and imagines an America free of European colonizers. Foster's work has been published in the Oxford Anthology of Modern American Poetry, Language for a New Century, Poetry from the Middle East, Asia, and Beyond, and State of the Union, 50 Political Poems. He co-edited the anthology Invocation LA, Urban Multicultural Poetry. Foster has taught in East LA for 25 years, as well as at the University of Iowa, the Cal uh, California Institute for the Arts, Nairobi University's Jack Kerouac School of Disembodied Poetics, Pomona University, and the University of California, Santa Cruz. He lives in Los Angeles. Alex Rivera is an award-winning filmmaker whose work explores themes of globalization, migration, and technology. His first feature, a cyberpunk thriller set in Mexico, Sleep Dealer, won multiple awards at Sundance in Berlin. Uh, Rivera's second feature, a documentary uh, slash scripted hybrid set in an immigration detention center, The Infiltrators, won the next Audience Award and the Innovator Award at the 2019 Sundance Film Festival. Rivera is a 2021 MacArthur Fellow, a Sundance Fellow, and was the Rothschild Lecturer at Harvard University. He studied at Hampshire College and also lives in Los Angeles. And finally, Karen Tay Yamashida is the author of seven books, including I Hotel, finalist for the National Book Award, and most recently, Sansei and Sensibility. Recipient of the Lifetime Achievement Award for Distinguished Contribution to American Letters from the National Book Foundation, the John Dos Passos Prize for Literature and U.S. Artist Ford Foundation Fellowship. She is Professor Emerita of Literature and Creative Writing at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and of course, the inaugural Artist in Residence for the Asian American Research Center. Uh, please welcome uh, uh, Seshi Foster, Alex Rivera, and Karen Tehye Mashita. So my name is Seshi Foster. I'm a poet, writer, novelist. Um, Oh, come to novels by way of writing poetry. And, and uh, much of my work is an intervention in place. I grew up in, in East LA. And when I grew up in East LA, I had no expectation that it would appear in, um, in, in, the, in the mass media. It was always a kind of uh, shadow land that was in the rain shadow of Hollywood. Uh, you know, LA broadcasts um, a kind of colonized imagination across the entire planet and has for a hundred years, um, but it never included East LA as far as I knew. Although, um, when I was uh, growing up, um, the first representation of East LA was. Uh, this movie called uh, From Hell to Eternity, or From Here to Eternity, whatever it was. Um, uh, and there's some clips of this in, in uh, the video I'm about to um, play. Uh, I first um, met Locke in uh, Washington, D.C. when the Smithsonian Institute asked us to come speak on, uh, talk to them about uh, the Asian Latino intersection, and and to, um, they asked me for a poem about 
that intersection for an exhibit that the Smithsonian was putting on. Um, and I thought that I would not just merely write a poem about that, but that the, the piece would itself be a collaboration between me and um, a uh, Chicano artist named Arturo Rumo. And so, um, so the videography in, in this video is, um, is his. Uh, and, and part of it, you'll see that he's standing in front of a, uh, a Japanese restaurant, the oldest remaining Japanese restaurant in uh, Boyle Heights, which used to have a sizable um, population, uh, Japanese American population, still has um, three Buddhist churches uh, remaining from, from there. Um, although, uh, yeah, uh, uh, East LA due to redlining. Oh, I'm stop. Guy Gabudon was born in 1926, raised in East LA, shined shoes on Skid Row until the age of 10. At 12, he moved in with the Nakano family of Boyle Heights, where he learned Japanese. When the Nakanos were sent to camps in Arizona, Gabudon joined the Marines at age 17 and used backstreet Japanese to capture 1,500 Japanese troops on Saipan. In the movie version, Gabudon was played by white actor Jeffrey Hunter, who at age 42 suffered a stroke in 1969 and died falling down the stairs. In the movie version, Skid Row was played by 1960's Bunker Hill and age 12 was played by a grasshopper flying in a summer field. Sweetness careened down the streets in buses and trolleys. In the movie version, A Boy Shining Shoes was played by Route 66 and relocation camps were played by cars passing by. Packards were played by Dodges. In the movie version, Cold Beer was played by Country Music and Nasal Twang. Jeffrey Hunter was played by Slight Nausea and Nostril Flare. His headache was played by the 20th century. In the movie version, Colors of the Rushing Ocean were played by the whir of a strip through the machine and the sizzling palm leaves were played by folded taco smell. Somebody was played by nobody. In the movie version, the present is played by an off-camera past with seagulls added or removed and palm trees painted on a canvas backdrop of night. Popcorn smell is played by cotton candy. In the movie version, Wishes were played by a voiceover of broken dishes and bouts of influenza were played by magazines in the rack. A funnel of smoke over the hills was played by extras dressed like citizens. In the movie version, East LA was played by the blood bursting an artery and dust specks thrown into a ray on the stairs, the golden moment bulking. Um, so actually this, this uh, cross-cultural, multicultural, multi-ethnic um, thread or theme of collaboration is a thread or theme in, in all of my work um, because my work is about community in East, in East LA and building a community. Um, and so it's, um, I feel that it's a counter narrative to the prevalent narratives of kind of, what would you call it, dystopian individualism that involve um, white people running in fear of their lives, shooting zombies across the landscape, uh, where people don't collaborate or cooperate, but instead they kill each other. 
Um, and I feel like that's a, an anti-community narrative that needs to have a counter-narrative, uh, you know, go against it. Um, because actually, um, we live in a post-genocide landscape. We live in a landscape that uh, people have been collaborating and, and cooperating to survive for generations. Um, and, they, and they wouldn't, you know, they wouldn't survive without it. So that's definitely a theme or, or thread in, in all my work in, in the poetry and uh, in the novels both. Um, Um, so, uh, my, okay, here it is, my, um, or our, uh, um, so my most recent novel was, um, uh, was also a collaboration between, between myself and Arturo Romo, and originally we had planned out this this novel where at least eight or ten of us would collaborate on, on writing a, a, a collective novel. Um, and then when the dust was settled, there was only two of us standing there. <laughs> and the other people were, they, were, they, were, they kept agreeing to do it. Um, and then like two, three years later, I realized like, if you want it done, you, you have to do it. Because no one's going to write your novel for you. Um, even though they say they might. Um, um, yeah. um, their schedules never did happen to match. Um, but, so anyway, um, as part of the novel process, um, Arturo and I uh, you know, drove hundreds of miles across all around East LA um, researching these hidden and secret or erased uh, sites of history cultural history in, in East LA, um, and, uh, and wrote fictionalized accounts based on either characters we met or invented. Um, and Arturo kept uh, generating um, videos, digital images, photographs, uh, drawings, all kinds of artwork that never fit into the, the novel uh, as a printed object um, there. Uh, and this is a uh, commercial for the main figure of the novel, which is a, a fictional dirigible company um, that represents those continual utopian failures throughout the 20th century. Uh, as you can see in the, the first shots of the video, the dirigibles famously exploded and, and doomed the uh, doomed that enterprise.
Hi, everybody. Um, thank you to the organizers. Um, thank you, Karen. Thank you, John. Bless you. It's such a gift and a delight to be together. And uh, thank you all for braving the elements and braving our, you know, the, uh, the recurring mini apocalypses that we're facing <laughs> these days with the weather. But so, uh, thank you all for coming out. It's really wonderful uh, to be together. And um, you know, this is the first time I've really been invited to speak directly about Latinx Asian connections in the speculative realm. So I'm here as a student, you know, um, looking forward to like learning and finding new, um, new angles and new insights in this conversation. But I thought I'd start off um, with just uh, a little bit about my entry into the speculative and, uh, and then pivot from there into a, a few connections that I started to see when I thought about it. Um, but basically, you know, science fiction was for me at first just a source of pleasure. My, my earliest cinematic experience um, was watching Star Wars in a drive-in in 1978. My dad fell asleep in the car next to me, and it was one of those moments when you realize how different you are from your parents. <laughs> <laughs> I was a religious experience. I was, I, mean, I was in, in transcendent uh, state of bliss, and my dad was snoring. But uh, and now I'm that snoring father. But it makes me nice. Um, but over time, you know, I discovered that in science fiction there was just so much more. There was, you know, um, really just a cornucopia of um, wonder uh, that's been part of my life now for a quarter century pretty deeply. Um, but fundamentally in the core of it was a, a set of metaphors to frame, describe, validate, and understand myself, family, and community. Um, in Papa Papa, which is my first uh, film that I made in, um, in 1995, I used the language and imagery of virtual reality to reflect on my Peruvian father's position, living in the United States, but through technologies of the time, television, the telephone, still being deeply connected to the world he'd left far behind. And so virtual reality, even though this was, again, uh, whatever it is, uh, 30 years ago, nearly 30 years ago, um, virtual reality didn't exist, but the imagination of it did. And it served as a kind of visual vocabulary to present a third space uh, between North and South um, to the audience, to make, make these kind of abstract concepts visual. Um, so virtual reality as a kind of reflection of the migrant mind space. Um, in a short film called the Dia de la Independencia from 1997, which was based on a comic strip by the legendary cartoonist Lalo Alcaraz, and which spoofed the Will Smith blockbuster Independence Day. You know, we use the imagery of, sci of the science fiction trope of the alien invasion, right, to visualize and mock the anti-immigrant hysteria around aliens coming across the border. And, uh, and you see, we uh, at the end there, there's a 3D model of a, a laser firing tube. <laughs> All right. Um, in Sleep Dealer, uh, my first feature film, 2008, um, I used the concept of telepresence to imagine a future world in which workers in Mexico enter factories where they plug their bodies into a futuristic internet to control machines, basically robots, that perform their labor in the United States. So the world of sleep dealer is a world in which pure labor crosses the border, but immigrant bodies stay out. Um, in a new project, I'm um, exploring themes of digital surveillance and immigration enforcement as the backdrop for a kind of new techno thriller. Um, I can talk about the project if anyone wants to hear about it, but it started with the prompt of um, I was hired to write and direct a science fiction Zorro film, right, based on the old <laughs> Avenger. But um, kind of my approach was to uh, reboot the character in the, basically the present day as an um, undocumented uh, youth, like a kind of a person who might be identified as a dreamer, who's a hacker and a Zorro fan. And um, when he's, his family is confronted by immigration enforcement, he uses hacker skills to enter their databases, finds out that the family, I mean, that the agency has been spying on his family. They know more about his history than he does. And now he needs to get into the building. And his, um, so he sort of slowly becomes a kind of modern day Zorro character. Um, anyway, so that's um, 
So basically, over the years, uh, I've come to believe that communities like ours, communities that are bifurcated by distance and that are the focus of a techno-military system, the immigration enforcement regime, its militarized borders, are particularly rich and urgent sites for sci-fi imaginings. Um, and that, this is a history that's deeply and uniquely shared between Asian and, and Latino communities. And not in a general sense as sort of targets of the system amongst many, but rather as foundational targets, right? Um, if you look at the immigration system, and I'll talk about a new project which is looking directly at these, these connections and these themes, you see it, it, the system is, is very, very vast and very complex, but I'll give you two images. One is the detention center, right, which you've heard about, I'm sure, and you understand is a, a, probably a space where immigrants are incarcerated while their cases are being processed, and the prison. And inside of prisons, there are immigrants as well um, being prosecuted under laws called 1325 and 26, which are actually the most prosecuted federal crimes in this country. The number one crime, if you, many people, if you think about it, prosecuted, many of us would assume it's a drug offense, but the actual most prosecuted crime in the federal court system is 1325 and 1326, which is uh, the law making it illegal to walk across the border. So the immigration system, detention centers, prisons. Strange system. Why does it have that shape? Why does it have a civil component, which is the detention system, immigration courts, border patrol agents, and then also has, has activities and enforcements in prisons, jails, police, etc. Why? The answer is that the system, when it was born, was born to target Chinese immigrants, right? In the wake of Chinese exclusion in the late 1800s, white supremacists here in the West were demanding the removal of Chinese immigrants. And they managed to get the federal government to try to prosecute that task. And when they invented this system, because there had been, previous to that moment in time, no deportation. There was no immigration enforcement in this country until the 1880s, Chinese exclusion. Um, and the, the white supremacist demand of the government was that they just basically remove them, remove them. And what was created in a nutshell was this administrative regime that didn't have the protections of trial by jury, didn't have the limited protections against unreasonable search and seizure, didn't have protections against the, you know, how long you could be incarcerated before you were convicted. They created this weird ass system with detention centers instead of prison. Same thing, but a different name. Immigration courts instead of uh, the normal courts, because they wanted it to obey different rules, right? They kind of sprouted this administrative mechanism to basically capture, detain, you're guilty until proven innocent, you're, you know, you're not given any of the nominal, and we know very fraught, fraught protections that exist in the criminal justice system, right? So the administrative system is born to target Chinese folks, and remove them as quickly as possible. Um, and that sort of was the system until the 1920s when white supremacy turned its focus on Mexicans. And the problem with the administrative removal system for Mexicans is you could administratively remove a Mexican, they could administratively walk right back, right? And so they needed a separate kind of system to control Mexican mobility. And so they birthed this thing called crimigration. We call it crimigration in the, in, in the scholarship today. But basically, they added in this dimension, like, oh, if you walk across the border, that's a crime. That's going to get you put in prison. That's going to get you punished in jail. And so they created like this second apparatus to punish um, specifically Mexicans. And um, if you Google um, 1326 is racist, you'll see that intrepid lawyers today are suing um, over the constitutionality of 1326 because these are not, um, what I'm sharing with you is not my opinion, it's in the congressional record. They explicitly passed 1325-26, these laws to target Mexicans in Congress. They said, how are we gonna get rid of these Mexicans? It's in the congressional record. And so, um, so the immigration system today with these sort of, it's like a janus of these two faces, the administrative embodied in the detention center and the criminal justice embodied in the prison those two faces are really, were born to target Asians and born to target Mexicans. And um, so that, that is a historical reality that is, um, brings our, our communities you know, into uh, deep 
uh, deep con connection, you know, in, in our American experience. And the last thing I'll share is I'm working currently on a film um, about the first man who was targeted for deportation. His name is Fong Du Ting. Um, his story was told um, in the visionary historian uh, Kelly Lytle Hernandez's book, City of Inmates. Super recommend that. Um, but Fong Yu Ting um, was a member of the Chinese Equal Rights League in Manhattan, a Chinese civil rights group in the 1880s and 1890s. And he turned himself in um, to be deported um, on purpose in order to create a test case to test the constitutionality of this new power of deportation. And uh, they went to the Supreme Court and incredibly um, almost won. And uh, they got three Supreme Court justices of the time, a terribly conservative racist court, but three of them, uh, three of the justices wrote a dissent saying that there should be no deportation in this country at all. Uh, so kind of an incredible act of, um, of just political uh, organizing and also political imagination. And so in terms of the speculative act of this, it doesn't take place in the future, it takes place in the past. But looking at the past is always a speculative act. We're imagining a reality that we can't perceive. And in this case, imagining a political world that people then were able to see in America, a, a country, this nation, without deportation. It was not a resolved thing that it would end up this way. And the visionary activists at that time teach us that, that another <coughs> world is possible and almost, almost uh, took shape. And then finally, um, there's an act of visual speculation. And this image, um, I don't know if people know where it's from, but it's from, uh, virtu it's from uh, artificial intelligence. Um, <laughs> there are images uh, of Chinese immigrants in the 1880s and 1890s, a pretty deep photographic record. And there are plenty of images of courtrooms, but there aren't images of Chinese immigrants in courtrooms. And so I don't know if we'll be using um, AI in this film at all, but I just want to throw that out there as a curveball <laughs> in terms of the science fictional reality we're inhabiting. That um, this is something like a speculative archive. The algorithm synthesizing, you know, two separate photo records um, to produce a, a rough image of what might have been. But thank you so much. Um, first of all, thank you, Locke and Jessica, and um, thank you, Jack. So much, and then I'm so happy that uh, Seshu and Alex um, agreed to come <laughs> to be here. Um, I'm, I'm really honored that you're here. Thank you, all of you. Um, so I'm going to just have a little short thing. This is the first book through the Arc of the Rainforest, and it was published in by Copy House Press in 1990. It's a speculative work. But I didn't know that then. We didn't have words for it. Um, and I guess I thought I might be playing with Gabriel Garcia Marquez and the whole idea of magical realism. I was just playing. Um, so recently, we've had the idea of turning it into a graphic novel. And I would be working with Dylan Froelich, who is a graphic artist. And so far, he's turned one chapter, the Matacón, into a graphic work. So here are a few pages um, from his, that project. We haven't published it yet, and we hope to do the whole book at some point. And then in Tropic of Orange, uh, which is set in the city of Los Angeles, I knew that in order to capture the complexity of voices and genres associated with Los Angeles, I would have to think about the book in a very different and diverse way. So for this book, I made use of a spreadsheet program. And in the day, it was called Lotus. And today, you know it as Excel. <laughs> <laughs> and I created that to organize my novel. So I created seven characters down and seven days across. And that would give you 49 chapters. And I began to impart in these seven narrators with seven stereotypical caricatures, and also literary genres and temporalities over one week in June, when midweek there would occur the summer solstice, the longest day of the year. So in doing so, the story could find parallel narratives that folded upon themselves. And the basic premise of this story is that in Orange, 
through which is threaded the line that is the Tropic of Cancer, is brought north by a pre-Columbian performance artist posing as a migrant laborer and dragging the Tropic of Cancer and everything else into Los Angeles. <laughs> Make sense? <laughs> <laughs> and um, later I, I had talked to someone and I said, you know, well, this, this, this pun, Anime Wong, came about uh, because my students didn't know who Anna May Wong was. And they thought that I was talking about an anime. <laughs> and I thought, this is hilarious. <laughs> And so I made a compilation of play, plays and performances that had a very, um, very short um, stage life, or no stage life at all. <laughs> and some ex of these plays existed only as text. And I decided, well, if you can't put them on stage, just put them in a book. So I did. And um, uh, most of these performances have to do rep with representations of Asians as gendered, stereotypic, robotic, alien form, futuristic, animation, and techno-oriental. So one of the performances, Anime Wong, is a play written in six acts, and I'm calling them six mangas. Um, and uh, we're going to do a short interactive reading here, which you promised to help me with. I did. <laughs> <laughs> so this is Anime Wong, the, the, the actress. And as you know, she's just gorgeous. Um, but, but wow. So you're going to help me. And I'm, I, I believe I, you'll see. I'll, I'll just point you in. So we are the Borg Asians. Lower your shields and surrender your bodies. We will add your biological and technical distinctiveness to our own. Your culture will adapt to service us. Resistance is futile. <laughs> now you are the audience and you get to read. Surrender your bodies. Your culture will adapt. Resistance is futile. Come on. Surrender your bodies, your culture will adapt. Resistance is futile. Again. Surrender your bodies, your culture will adapt. Resistance is futile. I surrender. I surrender all to you. Take me, take me, I give my life to you, baby. I'll break free, take me, I surrender. Who are you? You don't recognize me? <laughs> oh, oh, now I remember you're the one with the yellow complexion. Your yellow tinge, I love it. It's so artificial. How did you acquire it? It's my unique bioplast sheeting. I was born this way. Born? All right. Model, if you like. We don't often come across your model. That's because only a minority of us were modeled in this particular hue. A model minority. <laughs> How quaint. I suppose you're also intelligent in math and science and a hard-working achiever. Go to Berkeley. <laughs> and a Republican. I'm the one you want. <laughs> what makes you so sure? Maybe we lean toward the otaku type, the insular techno-weirdo peeping Tom who cultivates paranoia and stalking activities in game videos. Or we could go for Akira, a deranged psychosociopathic kid who, becoming powerful with a nuclear arsenal of magic and machine guns, takes bloody revenge. You mean you don't want me? You take those pretenders over me? 
I'm the real thing, completely synthetic. I'm cyber Asian down to my last emotion chip. <laughs> <laughs> well then, calm down and deactivate it, will you? We used to be like humans, you know, but we've evolved. I was never human, but I believe I'm becoming human. But sometimes I'm convinced I'm human. I dream about being human. I dream like a human. Humans dream, don't they? I dream. Dream. <laughs> yes, come to think of it, I had an amazing dream last night. And I have memories, distinct memories, like humans. I remember. What do you remember? Look, I have these photos. I can show them to you to prove my memories. See, there I am as a child growing up. And there with my parents. And here with my high school sweetheart. And there, and there, and there. Oh, rubbish. We also have an album of your memories. Observe. Here's a photo of you as a child and your siblings. And here's a photo of your dog. <laughs> here's a photo of your mother and your father. Here's your first girlfriend. <laughs> and here you are with your high school buddy. <laughs> Why are you mocking me? <laughs> My memories are stored at the Smithsonian. Pathetic photos, cyber agents, and your memories. Always trying to prove you're human. What's all the fuss about? Don't you see? I'm a living, thinking entity born in a sea of information. I remember, therefore I am. You remember what? You remember the past. Screw the past. Screw your photographic memories. Think of the superiority of Borg Asia. We live in the future at the cutting edge. All you others can never catch up. Now, surrender your bodies. Your culture will adapt. Resistance is futile. Surrender your bodies. Your culture will adapt. Resistance is futile. Do you surrender? I surrender. A foolish question, but do you love me? <laughs> you are pure data. Zero one, zero one, zero one, zero zero zero, zero one, zero zero one. What was that? Zero one. <laughs> Uh, zero, zero one, oh, one, zero, one, one, <laughs> ah, zero, one, what? What's not there? Too long? <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, well, I'll, I'll take, I'll go. Um, you know, it, it's, um, I did a film um, uh, that I didn't mention called The Infiltrators uh, some years ago, and uh, it uh, focused on a group of undocumented youth uh, activists that were um, doing civil disobedience, getting arrested, um, and facing their own deportation, kind of in public, by getting arrested on purpose. They were kind of like the the great-great-grandchildren of Fang Yu Ting, right? Because he did the same thing. He turned himself in to be deported on purpose. These young people were doing that, and I reached out to them because I'd seen them in the news, and I thought, man, when I'm going to meet these, 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 these young people, they're going to be, like, just hardcore Trotskyites, and, like, <laughs> but it was going to be just really hardcore. The things they were doing were super hardcore. They were risking literally their lives. And uh, instead, when I showed up there, it was pure laughter. It was like... Laughter and, and they were also, they would call each other illegals all the time. <laughs> like, hey, illegal, go get that poster over there. And they were laughing all the time. And, um, to, you know, so I think, number one, I think in, in terms of like just getting through life and getting through any type of like, you know, just stress or hell or nightmare, obviously laughter is so, so important. So there's that aspect of it. And then I think that percolates through in the culture we make, you know, that. Um, it's one thing to do, um, you know, to, to write um, history, another thing to write advertising copy, it's another thing to make, you know, speculative art. And I think when you're in the speculative realm, you have to have that weirdness, that play, that looseness. Um, it's what makes it vibrate, you know. Um. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I've always leaned toward satire and the joke. I, I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't not do that. And I, it has to be fun to write. Um, that's, that's the life of the, the writing as well. Um, and to see those juxtapositions. And once you see them, you can't stop seeing them. When one of my students came up and asked me what anime I was watching, because they thought I was really cool. <laughs> so I, yeah, I, could, I just, I just ran with it. Yeah. Um, in, in the case of, oh, so for example, the the dirigible novel, the dirigible kind of stands in, I think, like uh, like an orange in one of Karen's novels, or like a ball, who, uh, one, like Through the Ark of the Rainforest is narrated by a ball that floats uh, in front of one of the character's foreheads, and that's the narrator. Um, so to me, those, those objects and the dirigible represent the imagination. And you have to have uh, an imagination that's willing to go beyond the bounds of what you're given because what we're given is not sufficient to survive. Um, so, so yeah, the dirigible, you know, in, in the novel floats above Los Angeles and, and represents the imagination sort of looking, exploring this, this landscape. While we were working on the novel, um, I found out that uh, in the late 20s, um, uh, a World War I vet named William Powell came to Los Angeles because uh, as an African American, he, he was not allowed uh, to be trained as a pilot anywhere else, but, but uh, in Los Angeles they allowed him to pay for pilot's training. And because there was no air, aerospace industry during, uh, you know, during the 1920s, I don't know if you kids know that, but there was not a hundred years ago. Um, uh, he felt that um, if, if uh, African Americans could get in on the, the founding of the aerospace industry in the 1920s and 1930s, that they could literally lift themselves up out of Jim Crow oppression. Uh, and so he started... Um, he, he, he funded his, his string of Bessie Coleman Aero Clubs um, by, uh, th through the ga five gas stations that he owned in Los Angeles. He started Black Wings, which was uh, um, an airplane manufacturing company. 
um, and he provided scholarships for both men and uh, black men and women to to learn how to pilot pilot planes. Um, and he asked the first uh, African American commercial pilot, James Banning, to come and and be the lead pilot for his organization. So I guess that's an extended um, analogy that. We started off with this imaginary, um, an, an imaginary uh, airship company, and we found out that actually a hundred years ago, someone had d tried to do that, <laughs> and and that James Banning, his his um, um, his lead pilot, was buried in Evergreen Cemetery in East LA, uh, and he has a has a little tombstone that's visited by no one, known by no one. And that that history, you know, how, who knows that history? Like no one. But it was uncovered by us because we started imagining. Um, thank you for those answers. Those responses. It, it also makes me think. You know, I'm just thinking about this encounter we're having here. Like, what a, a lovely space this uh, panel has created, and the way that um, play is not only a sort of catalyst. Uh, for imagining beyond the world that we've been given, but it is also a space of encounter, a really uh, important catalyst, I think, for a kind of affect for readers and audiences. Um, you know, uh, so that I think there's a politics in, in that aspect of it as well. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and, and move to uh, actually some audience questions. And I'll start it off with a question that we got from Zoom and that will give um, those of you who are here in person a chance to maybe um, think uh, how to articulate your own questions and comments. Um, this is a question for Alex from Karen Chicas. Um, hi, Alex. <laughs> You've extensively spoken on how the genre of sci-fi has been extremely influential in the making of several of your short films and in your first feature, Sleep Dealer. What specific aspects of the sci-fi genre have you found most attractive or compelling in the themes that prominently appear in your film work? Themes such as immigration, racial identity, technology, and ecology. And I'll just take the chance to add on, I hope Karen doesn't mind, that um, ecological devastation or environmental de degradation is also, a, I think, a thread running through all of your work. And I'd love to hear all of you uh, maybe just comment a little bit on that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, nice to talk to you too. <laughs> um, no, but the uh, but in terms of the what unifies, because I think in my presentation, hopefully, I took um, explained a couple of the specific angles through the through the work. Um, but I think what unifies it is questions of the body, essentially the body and the sort of decomposition of the subject uh, through technology, and whether it's uh, systems of communication um, like uh, the telephone, the television that was really first how I started to think about connections between the technological realm, that the rhetoric of technology, and migration, um, which I saw in my dad's life, or technologies of like telepresence, remote control, um, you know, and, and also I think just the marking of the body, um, you know, which we see in, in terms of the deep history of immigration, we see it in the photograph, and really the photograph was essential to the production of early uh, immigration enforcement, um, you know, so the tech, technology's relationship to the body is it haunts immigration history and it also provides us like a, a rhetoric and a language to just, that I think it's not coincidental, it's like a language of disintegration, globalization, dis, you know, um, yeah, of alienation. These are phenomena that we're living through globally but the migrant um, is kind of in the crosshairs, is, is the person who's on the sort of searing edge of that. And so there are science fictional resonances right there at that intersection that are really uh, powerful and rich and, and um, you know, that, that's where I, I, it's like a vein that I've, I've been trying to tap into and, and explore and also been inspired by a lot of other uh, folks doing, you know, looking at exactly those questions. And the environment, I'll, 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 I'll pass the baton. Yeah. Well, um, I, I lived in Brazil through the 70s, almost into the 80s, for a decade. 
And uh, while I was there, Brazilians uh, were talking about the, a satellite, um, you know, that the satellite could see what was, see the Earth. And they were really surprised to see that the thing, the two things that the uh, satellite could see was, was, the, was the wall of China and then the swaths of uh, land in the Amazon forest that were being burned. And uh, there was news to them, and I was living in Sao Paulo. So, you know, Brazil's a huge country, so Sao Paulo is very much in the south. And I was talking to um, journalists who were working on the project, and they were talking about the swaths of land that were being burned. And then they also started to talk about the you know, how, how the land uh, was taken over in Brazil, that all of Brazil was a big jungle or forest, and that very slowly it was taken over, burnt, and then taken over by um, urban development and farming and that sort of thing. And I began to think about that in terms of the migration or the immigration of Japanese and their participation in this you know, what they thought they were coming to as pioneers to a new land and um, taking over the land and, and, um, and making new crops and things. But they were all part of this settlement of the land. And then they were discovering, of course, Indian artifacts and native uh, evidence of native people being there. And all of these things crowded into my thinking about um, that immigration. So, when I came, I couldn't ever, I couldn't publish the first book, which was about the Japanese in Brazil. And um, then I went to, my husband is always telling crazy stories. And we have to listen to them at dinner time all the time. <laughs> I just got tired of listening to them. Or, I can, I, I, oh, but they're funny, but you have to hear them over and over again. And so I said, well, okay, I'm going to write them. So maybe that'll be. And so one of the stories was about, you know, a guy with a ball, a, sat a personal satellite. And there were other stories, and they were all typically Brazilian, uh, but also typically Ronaldo stories. <laughs> and uh, so I started to, to write the stories and compile them. And then at one point, I was doing this all because I was a secretary over at a television station. I had nothing to do. <coughs> so I was just typing these stories. And I called him up one day and I said, you know, I've got five stories, but can I make all of the characters meet and turn it into a novel? And, you know, he's busy. He says, yeah, do whatever you want. <laughs> so then I turned that into the trop, the, yeah. Through the art. Yeah, through the art of the rainforest. It wasn't called that in those days. So, and then started to think about really what was happening to the Amazon, although I had never visited and then imagine that it was going to turn into this plastic desert. So, there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, well, I think w one of the roots of, of ecological disasters that we're living in, um, deforestation and um, California, burning down um, is uh, it lies in the imagination that and, and when we're engaged in speculative fiction we're asking people to engage in the, their imaginations in uh, in counter narrative ways and counter intuitive ways because you know there's a reason that that everybody um, in this room knows more about iPhones and iPads and and even Karen um, <laughs> than, than we know about like what is that tree right there what what are the names and purposes and uses of, of all the um, all the living plants and everything around us at all times like when we walk outside we know the brand names of the cars going by, we know the names of the streets and so forth. And so like, I feel like speculative fiction is a, an engagement of your imagination for decolonization. Uh, it, you know, that's at least one of the things that you could do with it. Um, and that 
you know, it, it, we would hope that it reorients you to the landscape that you live in yourself. I think it's about, you know, playing again, going back to that and, and, and game playing so that you enter a game where you play, but when you do that, you can fail. But what happens is you learn to fail. And learning to fail makes you figure out how to succeed the next time. And uh, I think that play is very important, rather than to practice it on people and to destroy them or destroy your environment. So what happens if you do it in your imagination first? My students, I would ask my students, why are you writing this? It's so, yeah, why are you writing this? It's just because this is the only way it can happen. And I can figure out what can happen from this. Some questions or comments from people who are here in person. Yeah. Um, thank you so much to the whole panel for this wonderful speculative wandering uh, between my texts and ideas. And my question is how identity might be considered speculative, because if one of the like, thematic thematic centers of the talk today is the intersection between Asian American and Latinx cultural experience and cultural production. How could we consider identity as combining and recombining some of these things? The way speculative fiction combines and recombines both texts and genres and histories. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that what's interesting uh, in the last 10, maybe 15 years, I've been seeing um, people of color and uh, you know trans and other genders folks writing speculative work. And it's, that's, it seems obvious that we should be entering this world because we're the first aliens. I mean, my parents were called aliens, not they were called non-aliens during the war. And, and I always thought about that. So yeah, that is those identities um, to question them and but also to experience your body in different spaces. Um, the the writer that I really love is um, Samuel R. Delaney, Chip Delaney, and he wrote Babel 17. And what he did with the body and how he kind of rethought gender and um, you know the physicality and what we would be in the future and how what we could be. Yeah, it it, it really was um, a changing moment, I think. I find your question super rich and it's exciting and explosive, really. I mean, I think naming the, the project of identity itself, I, I heard that in your question, like kind of asking if the, the, the sort of framework of identity um, itself is a type of speculative uh, project or a type of imagining. Um, because, you know, um, is, you know I, I went to college in the 1990s and that was, I don't know where it sits in the history of identity politics, but there was like a wave of thinking very actively about identity in the 90s that was impacting art exhibits, impacting film festivals. It was sort of like, I don't know if it's first wave, second wave, but it was a wave of, of real uh, centering of, of identity, um, contesting of identity in all these spaces of cultural production that were clearly in a moment like that now as well. And for me, a thing that's always been tricky is how do you deploy those identities, work within them, use them in order to contest them without uh, essentializing them and you know, without making them seem natural, without making them seem logical. Um, you know, it's not, nothing I've addressed, addressed head on in, in my work. Um, it's a little bit there in Papa Papa um, because my father has to, uh, he's a brown man from South America. Um, he flew here to the United States in the late 1950s, got off the airplane in Miami and had to go into a white or a colored bathroom. And he talks about which one do I go into? And he said, well, what the heck, I'm white. And, and, you know, but so there's a little bit in Papa Papa talking about mm, identity as a just a, a fraught sphere of, of thought. But it's just so complicated because obviously in this country, people have been, you know, everything whipped, raped, killed, imprisoned over these, you know, these, these lines, these fault lines that are also a type of story, uh, a type of a fantasy and um, how do you contest that fantasy which is also so real without lending it the power of reality you know because i think it's i i personally think it's important to always destabilize um 
these these identities and then the identity of asian and latino we share yeah. and ex ex they're all these categories black white native they're all stupid categories but latino and asian are especially fraught they're so vast and so they're really hard to like hold on to and really but obviously also very material bloody and fleshy and right. fantasy and 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 um so what I was working with in Anime Wong was really to look at the stereotypes that, we, that we've adopted for ourselves in J-pop and K-pop, and to look at the animation of the, the Asian with the big eyes and, and uh, the kinds of, um, yeah, what manga has done to our self-perception of ourselves. And we, we're sort of eating it, embodying it, and then throwing it back, and then uh, enjoying it. I don't, I really don't know. I, so I was trying to fool around with that. Um, yeah. Um, well, I grew up during the Chicano movement, the politics of the Chicano movement as a, as a resistance movement were important to me. It was part of the community that I grew up in, lived in. Um, and, uh, you know, didn't feel that, didn't feel personally confined by it because I also had friends who were Asian American activists in, in Little Tokyo. And, um, and my first publication was in Ghidra, the Little Tokyo Asian American activist uh, newspaper. Um, but I feel like, you know, that there were Americans and then there were Asian Americans and that we, we were always labeled with this hyphen between it. And I always felt like the hyphen is a metaphor for the border. That the border is drawn on us, mm -hmm. and but not on the Americans. The Americans have no border. Uh, you know, hyphenated Americans have borders, and it's part of it's made to be part of our identity. But um, the Chicano movement dispensed with that by calling themselves Chicanos, and certainly, um, and certainly, like oh, recently, I've heard. Um, from Central American descendants or activists, like criticisms that of the Chicano movement as dinosaurs and this and that, a misogynist or whatever. <laughs> um, but I think that the redefinition of people is, is a self-determination that movements make, that an individual doesn't, cannot make them uh, on their own, that it's, that's a political, uh, designation made by made by a group, either outside you or or your community, um, and yeah, hopefully not essentialist, because yeah, because that's a marketing tool. Well, I wish that we had more time for questions, but um, we do have a, a reception and um, some time to interact with. Um, Karen and Sashu and Alex, and I hope you'll all join me in thanking them one more time for their incredible presence here.